the hypopressive training is this like combination of breath and postural training. So it's like you can't have good posture without good breathing. You can't have good breathing without good posture. So they they really go hand in hand. The breathing allows the spinal curves to come back into their best position. Welcome to the Surf Strong Show, conversations for a healthy community. I'm your host, Greg Finch. I'd like to remind you to like, comment, subscribe to this and all of our episodes of the Surf Strong Show wherever you get your podcasts. For all show notes and links that we talk about in the episodes, videos of the podcast, you can go to surfstrongfit.com slash podcast for this and all the past episodes. Thanks for joining us. It really means a lot. Today we welcome Dr. Angie Miller a doctor of physical therapy working with clients in her practice in Kauai, as well as remotely through her core recovery method. We discuss her taking up surfing later in life and how that really has allowed her to face some of her fears. We discuss her hypopressive breathing method and how it really allows us to access the involuntary side of our nervous system and reflexively trigger more fully our core muscle activation. Let's get to our conversation with Dr. Angie Miller. Angie, thank you so much for being a part of the Surf Strong Show. I really appreciate you taking the time to come on today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. All right, great. Well, I, I, I said this on the last, to the last episode I did too. I've really got to up my background game because everybody that I've had on recently has a much better background than me. So maybe that's good in the long run. It puts the eyes on the guest, which is where it should be. Sure. <laughs> so um, I know that you're uh, just learning to surf and kind of taking that um, as part of what we're doing. And surfing is just a thread that goes throughout the shows here. It, but and so what I ask a lot of my guests is describe your last wave, good, bad or ugly. And it's really kind of the point, like we're all in different stages. Surfing is uh, never an end game. It's a continuum. And right. for those of us that have surfed most of our life, Sometimes we'll be out in the ocean and it's like we've never searched before. Falling all the time, doing all this stuff. So just describe the last time you were pushed by a wave in the ocean. Okay, yeah. Um, so I'm, yeah, just barely starting to learn how to surf. Um, and I'm a mom to a two and a half year old. So I, I don't have a lot of time either. Um, but yeah, the last time I was in the ocean, um, yeah, being pushed by a wave was, yeah, amazing. I was uh, with some friends and it was a, a gorgeous day. Uh, it was raining a little bit and uh, a rainbow actually came out while we were out there. So that was really fun. Um, and yeah, I was I was actually, I, my friend pushed me into the wave, like literally. I, I still need that level of assistance <laughs> to, to catch a wave. So I'm still learning how to like read the ocean and um, you know, actually catch a wave. But if I'm pushed onto one, I can typically uh, stand up. So yeah, this was this was a fun one. It was a kind of a rainy day. Then the rain broke, a rainbow came out. And um, I did I, I caught one with with some assistance from a friend. Nice. Yeah. It's a team. It's a team effort. Sometimes that's a, there's, that's a good thing. <laughs> Share with your friends yeah. and your time. So exactly. as you so, so being a uh, uh, at this point in your life, and we'll talk about your accomplishments and what you're doing in your physical therapy practice and all that stuff, but talk about what it is like. Most of uh, a lot of the listeners that we have are surfers, but not all of them. And describe the difficulty of surfing and all those things that come in with it. Like, describe what that's like that first time coming into the ocean and, and being exposed to surfing that way. It's difficult, again, for us that have surfed for decades, sometimes it's just like you've never done it before. Like what spurred yeah. you to take that on? Yeah, I've, um, so being born and raised in Colorado, I've always been just drawn to the ocean because it's so different from what I know and how I was raised and, um, and it's just, yeah, it's drawn me because it's it's so different from what I know. It feels like it's it's very much outside of my comfort zone, um, but it's a world I want to explore. And I know that, um, 
you know, facing my fears associated with like being in water and drowning and all of those things is facing those fears and being in those uncomfortable situations. Um, I just intuitively know will help me grow. And so I, you know, I kind of seek things out like that. So, um, yeah, it just, it, I just wanted to try something new. I, I grew up skiing. Um, and so not snowboarding. So, you know, having my feet together is definitely a new thing too. Um, and yeah, the, the challenge of it for sure. Like for me, it's intimidating just like, cause I don't, I, I don't really know how to read the water yet. So that's a level of intimidation. Navigating a board, you know, and actually like being a beginner, a lot of people say, um, you know, have a big long board. However, that's actually, I'm not a super strong swimmer either. And so actually having a big board is challenging to navigate and like get out there on that big board. Um, and so I like to try to, the smaller board because it just feels like more comfortable to actually like navigate that. And then, um, yeah, and then the whole layer of, you know, actually catching the wave um, is is just, I'm like, okay, once I get there, you know, I kind of feel like, um, I don't know, like, like you said, you're like riding this wave of life. Like I feel like surfing and being in the water is like very much a mirror of, um, like life as, as a whole. And it's like this, uh, you know, there's always these like currents of energy, like moving through us in our life. And so to like ride this current of energy in the water that is like, so, um, physical and tangible is just really exciting and awe inspiring to me. Um, yeah, those so, two po those two points right there are, are you, you really have brought it down to the essence for for me of the two things that I focus on the most, which is exactly what you just said that feeling that energy in that presence in this in this entity that you know everything we're we're so insignificant you know in this world that yeah. we live in we are of course the most important thing within our own head of course we are. That's the human nature yeah. of that self-centered part that we're always trying to work and balance on. But this, the second you put your foot in the ocean, that that clearly goes away. And you're like, oh, yeah, no, I, I'm just part of this much larger thing. And so that presence and that yeah. energy is it. And then the other thing is exactly that same thing. It's that that being confronted with those fears that are legitimate and are real but tend to be so exacerbated where you realize, oh, oh, okay, no, this really is where I am. My abilities here and being slightly outside of that comfort zone of your ability and your experience, that is growth. And so that's gr wonderful that you recognize that. And I always try to remind myself of that is that really is where you're growing and life really exists on those places. We have this tendency in our head and there's, you know, we're evolved to protect this life that we have for obvious reasons and perpetuating those things down the line. So safety yeah. is a primary concern, but unfortunately it just tends to pull us in more and more and more and more and we're exploring less, less, less if we allow that to happen. So yeah. things like surfing and things like things that we're not really comfortable with, it forces you to examine why that is. Why am I not comfortable with this? And what you imagine it to be, and a lot of times what it is, are vastly different. Yeah, I, I agree with that completely. Um, and, you know, an, another thing that makes me think of is, yeah, it, in the sense of surfing and going outside of your comfort zone and being really faced with like survival fears. Um, surfing is like, especially when you just get like pounded by a wave. Um, it, it's actually relaxation and surrender under those conditions that allow you to maintain your blood oxygen, right? <laughs> to yeah. be able to 
you know, uh, make it, make it out of the water, make it back. And, um, you know, I say this as like such a beginner and I can't imagine riding like giant waves or anything like that. And it just, um, I, I love working with uh, clients who are, you know, big wave surfers and stuff because it's just so incredible to me. So I love to talk about it and, and hear about it. Um, but yeah, that that's a lesson like I've really learned in surfing is, yeah, when you are faced with that, you know, that like fear and that, um, you know, survival situation, it's actually how do I relax into this and like surrender into this, um, to, to preserve like my own energy. Like you actually kind of have to go back inside instead of focus externally. And, um, I think that that really applies to life too. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because when, when I do these episodes and we have various guests on, you, you just you you start you could count the analogies that come through each episode, and and they're all very just and all very significant. But it, it is like surfing just is that way. I mean, it's such a core part of who I am, uh, obviously. But it, it's just you you find it mirrored in different places. And kind of back to what you were saying, I can only speak for my own level of surfing is. At each stage, like looking back through my life and learning and then a little bit more and a little bit more, like that feeling is the same as you start to expand both size of wave, power of wave, maybe duration of time that you're surfing, maybe the performance on the wave itself. Like at each stage, it's still always just that slightly outside that comfort zone. That place is the same. Yeah. It's always feels the same. Now, again, I'm not surfing, you know, massive swell and massive waves in these places, but you know, everything's relative and it comes down to, again, that idea of surrender and, and preserving coupled with a foundation of preparation. Confidence comes oh, so yeah. much from that preparation of like, my breath is right where it needs to be right now. My, my balance, my strength, my endurance. I've been preparing for all of these things. That just helps you reinforce that confidence. But in that moment, it absolutely is that place. If you, if you panic or you get outside of that place where your, your practice and your experience is, doesn't really matter how much you're preparing because you are you're just losing all of that so quickly so it's interesting that part of it. it at each stage it kind of feels the same you know you're just continuing to take that next step yeah yeah that makes so much sense i agree the preparation is what leads to true confidence yeah again yeah. another another analogy you can put it in any <laughs> any area of that world right that we're talking about preparing for something and having the confidence come with it with the experience so so let's talk you you talked about growing up in colorado uh you make your home now in Kauai, hawaii is that right yeah 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 great so and uh, so talk a little bit you're uh you have a doctorate in physical therapy and you have a practice there in Kauai. talk a little bit about what how did you decide that path for that professional path for yourself was it early something you knew you wanted to pursue how did you kind of go through that path yeah. Um, so I, I went through some physical therapy, um, growing up, I played softball. I was a pitcher and had some, uh, back and shoulder problems. And so my physical therapist, uh, was really helpful. And I just always kind of thought in the back of my head, you know, this would be something, um, I would really love to do. Um, but actually I started out uh, in college with just a business degree. Um, and it was not interesting to me at all. And so I switched, switched my major to sports medicine. And that's really when I decided, okay, I'm just going to go all the way through and, you know, get my doctorate and be a physical therapist. Um, I really felt like it was a profession that, um, is always, it's always changing. Like we're always learning new things. Um, and so there, you know, there is a level of like kind of routine to it, um, but yet you can do so much with it and 
And it's something, it's, it's a profession that I knew that I would always be learning and expanding. So when you first um, got out of school, did you work in kind of that traditional physical therapy office where we're maybe doing post knee surgery or shoulder rehab? Did you kind of have some of that um, experience as well? Yes, absolutely. Yep. That's how I came out of PT school. Um, yeah, worked in, I actually started out in uh, like acute rehabs facilities and hospitals working with people uh, with spinal cord injuries, brain injuries. Um, did some time in nursing homes, did uh, home health care, uh, did some work with um, pediatrics like autism and developmental delay. Um, and then you know, always had, you know, this like really strong sports medicine background. So I just kept going back to that and then worked more into the typical like outpatient ortho orthopedic clinic, like you said, like post-op knee replacements. Um, and, and so people who were a little bit more um, had like athletic injuries or, you know, sports related things. And uh, a lot of my clients in Colorado were uh, elite athletes. So, you know, marathon runners, triathletes, uh, cyclists, and um, and then started kind of gravitating, <clears throat> gravitating towards the uh, female athlete quite a bit too. And these women, you know, had a lot of pelvic floor dysfunction and, you know, needed to rehab postpartum. And so that's really what led me into the women's health, pelvic health um, space. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, and then I, I worked, I, I kind of took that and uh, partnered up with uh, Kaiser and worked in, the, in their urogynecology department, created a women's health program in their urogynecology department for about three years. And it was after that, it, it, all of these were like incredible experiences that created my, um, my perspective on physical therapy and on healing. Um, and yeah, it, 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 it was great in the sense that I was able to see patterns I wouldn't have seen otherwise. I, I absolutely had to start out in hospitals, outpatient clinics. Like I had to start out in this, in like the typical Western medicine model, um, because it allowed me to see what I needed to see to then uh, create what I've created now today. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was really, I started to get discouraged about just the insurance industry and how, you know, Western medicine is very much, um, how do I say it? Uh, broken. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a good way to say it. Broken <laughs> and, um, motivated by money. Right. Like and so, you know, working within those clinics that accepted insurance, um, I was not able to provide my patients with the level of care I knew that they needed. Yeah. And so well, that's really what led me to um, break away from that and just completely start my own practice and be able to really, um, yeah, care for clients in the way that I, I know is is you know, the best and, and the best, um, model that I can, you know, provide those. Yeah. Know. When I was go, when I was finishing up my, um, my degree, uh, my bachelor's degree, I, I was really kind of at that, um, that place where I was deciding, okay, am I going to, I, I, I was, I, I took some years off from, from college and to travel and surf and kind of do those things. I just wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to focus into this. And I just knew I was going to go through this university setting and come out with a degree and be like, just lost. I just sensed something yeah. about that. Like I need a little bit of time to do some of these other things. And so I was slightly older. I was 27 when I graduated, but it helped me focus. But when I was getting into like my upper division, I was really at this place where I was like, okay, I want to be in this space and I'm either going to go physical therapy or I'm going to go more into my own studio, more on the coaching end, more on the training end. And so I took a job as a, as a physical therapy assistant just to, 
just to oh, kind of as, as an aid actually first, you know, to see if yeah. do I want to pursue this? And yeah. I can sense kind of what you're saying too, because I did experience that the, the repetitions of working with individuals was really helpful to see uh, some patterns or see some recurrence of things and, and ways and tools and learning under some therapists to kind of work through some of these things. But what I started to sense really quickly, some of the insurance model for sure, just to see like, okay, they're going to be here twice a week for maybe six weeks at the top end. Yeah. Okay, we have this much time. What are we going to focus on to give them as much as we can give them for this time? And knowing, unfortunately, with a certain demographic, uh, whether it's age, I'm going to generalize here, of course, but like the certain yeah. demographic, 80% of them, you know, are not going to continue to stay consistent with the things that they need to do. And that just became right. very clear because you would see this recurrence. You would see right. oh, that person's back for the same exact thing a year later. And or the therapist would be like, oh, yeah, they've come, they come once a year. to come. And, and I just was like, mm, that's not that doesn't feel good. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That self-responsibility is so important in healing. And I don't think that like uh, our Western medicine model like really promotes that. Um, no. And so, yeah, exactly. Like you come into a PT clinic and you just like, you know, do these exercises you could totally do at home and you just have somebody sitting there watching you. So it's like, that's not, you know, yeah, it's therapeutic on a level, but it's like, okay, you know, you could do that at home. So like, let's give you something that like you couldn't get anywhere else and you could only do here. Um, mm -hmm. So, and, you know, being able to, you know, have those conversations with my patients uh, is really what, you know, shifted things and changed things. Yeah. Um, so, me, at, so, yeah. so as a patient comes in, well, let's just use for, you know, for the, for this, for this show, a, a, a client that surfs comes in and um, it can be for, it doesn't really matter what the injury is, whether it's, you know, acute or it's chronic, they're coming in, let's just say it's a shoulder discomfort, you know, they're just ha they're, they're finding that they don't have the endurance that they had before. And, and maybe they're not even at the level of having a having a MRI or anything yet. They're just coming in, trying to find some things out from the Western model that you had the experience within and evolving into what you do now, which we're going to go into more depth here in a second. Um, talk about how you how you start with that patient kind of the things that you prioritize, whether it's some assessment, um, how you kind of line them up with the program. I know it's specific to an individual, but do you have a general kind of plan that you start with? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, everybody gets intake paperwork. So they come in, you know, knowing what we're going to talk about. Um, and really what I'm interested in is, you know, what they do on a day to day basis. So what what are their hobbies and, and what's their profession? And then um, I want to know, you know, their aspirations, um, you know, in their life. So physical aspirations, mental, emotional. And I, I also want to know, like, what challenges they're facing. So same physical, mental, emotional challenges, because um, all of that is so connected. And so, um, you know, I specialize in the physical realm and the mechanics and the anatomy and, and all of that. But I get to witness that um, every day that it's so connected. So um, having that conversation right off the bat, I think, is really important. Just um, it, it brings like the, you know, the real like underlying humanity to to the the situation kind of how you said in the beginning like everybody's equal in the water it's like everybody's equal we're all humans we all have our stuff you know and it is interconnected so let's just like be real about it um and so i kind of start there and as they're telling me about their life and what they you know what they do who they are what, what's challenging um i'm looking at their posture and i'm looking at how they breathe and I watch how they walk in and I, I look at how they sit and, you know, so I, I have these eyes where 
I don't know. I see people without their skin on. <laughs> yeah. like, it's like, okay, yeah. this muscle over here is tight. And look at how this person like always holds their head or their shoulder or whatever. So um, I actually don't start by talking about the injury um, because sometimes that biases me. I, I like to like just come in like fully clear and just get this you know, a a little bit more like unbiased uh, observation of them. Um, And then then we'll start getting into the injury a little bit more. Um, And so, you know, take a background about the injury, how it happened, or maybe it's not an injury. Maybe it's just something that, you know, they've dealt with their whole life or whatever it might be, but the problem that they're seeking to resolve. And then, um, yeah, and then I talk I, I talk a lot about hydration. Hydration is like critical. Um, I ask about sleep, nutrition. Um, those are those are critical things. So in um, I kind of call that I call that like your hygiene. You know, you have to have like a good hygiene. You have to have good uh, uh, an environment in your body that promotes healing. And so I, I like to start there because we can do all the exercise interventions and I can do all the, you know, cool manual therapy stuff. Um, but if you're not you know, adequately hydrated, if you don't have good sleep, if you're not like nourishing your body, you're not going to have the level of effect, you know, you're, or the, um, you're, you're not going to, the, the healing process is going to be slower. It's, you know, we're going to be facing like more obstacles. So it's, I like to start there. Um, and then once we get through that, then I do more of a physical assessment. And so that's when, you know, I'm looking more, you know, mechanically at at the anatomy and uh, the strength and all of that. Um, And it's all very closely tied into how they breathe. Um, That's like the cornerstone to to everything. So let's talk about, um, so with the surfers that you work with, uh, talk about your your hypopressive training, um, kind of define what that is for you, um, and, and how you would describe it to a new, uh, a new patient coming in and then, uh, applying that to, uh, the surfing population that you work with, how are they utilizing that? Um, you know, a lot of the breath training and stuff that we do tends to be focused on, you know, recovery itself, recovery within the water, um, being able to be present, like we talked about earlier, not, wasting this critical resource in a, in a very dangerous situation um, and working through that. But talk about how, um, you know, I, I've read a little bit about some of the foundational principles of it, but talk about how you utilize that with your surfing clients. Okay. Yeah. So hypopressive training is a, um, it's a, it's a method that combines breath work and postural training. And it is unique in that it is primarily targeted towards our involuntary nervous system, which is also called the autonomic nervous system. And so it elicits reflexive involuntary activation of your deepest core muscles. And so your core is really everything except for your arms and legs. Okay, so when we're when we're talking about like the core, it's it's actually a lot more than just your six pack abs, like you know most people kind of think about. And so our core muscles are incredibly unique in their physiology, in that eighty percent of the muscle fibers of the core are involuntary. So we have no voluntary control over them. So doing things like uh, I don't know crunches or sit ups or kegels, like you know, where you're voluntary thinking about that muscle activation, you're only accessing 20% of those muscles. And so those don't really translate to a functional improvement in, you know, core muscle strength. So hypopressive training is able to access the involuntary side of our nervous system and reflexively trigger that like 100% uh, core muscle fiber activation. Hypopressive training also decompresses the spine. So it increases the space uh, between all of the vertebrae in the spine, which will increase the space around the nerve roots that come out of the spinal cord and give them more, 
you know, room, which results in better blood flow and lymph flow and nerve conduction. So that improves muscle function of the limbs, muscle function of the core. Um, also, you know, that spinal decompression, that hypopressive training uh, promotes is so excellent for surfers specifically because so many surfers come in with whiplash injuries. That's like the primary thing I see with surfers, you know, whiplash to the neck, the lower back. Um, and they come in with all these like crazy alignment issues, right? Because you're like really one sided. And so, you know, everybody has a little bit of a spinal rotation and a rib rotation and a pelvic torque and, you know, all sorts of stuff going on with their SI joint. Um, and then very commonly I see, you know, overextension of the thoracic spine, kind of these like flattened spine. That's like a real typical surfer spine, uh, typical of whiplash injuries. So hypopressive training is incredible at restoring the natural curves of the spine. So the spine should be shaped like an S. And so if, if any part of the spine is straightened, then that part of the spinal cord is straightened. And when it's straightened, it's actually too tense and it's deprived of blood flow. So those, those curves in the spine like allow slack and allow circulation to occur. Um, and so hypopressive training creates this great spinal decompression and helps to restore optimal curves in the spine. Um, and, and I would imagine it also helps promote um, that proper alignment between those, say, hip up through T-spine to where your head is. So those are really stacking on top of each other. So you're not tense and holding them out of alignment, constantly trying to get back to that place. That curve is that natural state of being in alignment there. Yes. Yeah, exactly. It has incredible impact on your posture. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's where, um, you know, kind of like I said, the hypopressive training is this like combination of breath and postural training. So it's like you can't have good posture without good breathing. You can't have good breathing without good posture. So they they really go hand in hand. The breathing allows the spinal curves to come back into their best position. Um, and then, you know, you having that awareness will further deepen your breath. So is, is there a yeah. nice um, little intro uh, to hypopressive training that we could have uh, listeners try right now? Obviously, they're not going to get the full range of the complement of all the training and, and, and the involvement of that. But is there a little sample that we could have listeners do right now to kind of just get exposed to it yeah sure <laughs> sure um so so some people will be watching and some people will just be listening so if there's something that straddles that line we'll try that right okay um yeah we can absolutely do this i do um i teach this virtually as well and i you know i, I teach it through an online program so you can learn it for sure through um yeah, virtually. Yeah. So, okay. So just to kind of attempt it, you want to start by aligning your ears over your shoulders and your shoulders over your hips. So maybe you're sitting down, maybe you're standing. If you're standing, have your feet hip width distance apart and bend your knees a little bit. Okay. And then come back to that, you know, alignment of ears, shoulders, hips. Okay. The next piece is to lengthen your waist. So lift your rib cage away from your pelvis as much as you possibly can. So this elongation of your waist will reflexively activate your core muscles in, in the best way. Okay. And then expand your rib cage. So think about, um, think about like how Superman would stand or like if you were going to try to intimidate somebody like you would broaden your chest on the front and you broaden your, your, you know, the back of your chest as well. Okay. So that posture, that alignment, ears, shoulders, hips aligned, long waist, open rib cage. That's the posture that will promote uh, the fullest lung capacity. 
um, and reflex of core muscle activation. Um, just because I'm talking to surfers here, I'm going to add one more thing to that posture. A lot of times when I say, um, you know, stand tall, right, or like grow through the crown of your head or lengthen your waist, right, a lot of people will actually do this thing where they kind of squeeze their shoulder blades and lift their chin. And we were, we were taught, I mean, so many people think that this is like good posture, right? It's not good posture. So lifting your chin compresses your spine, okay? Squeezing your shoulder blades reduces the, the capacity and mobility of your rib cage. So you'll never be able to take a full breath in with your, with your spine straightened like that. So actually try that right now. We could try that. Mm -hmm. So squeeze your shoulder blades and then try to take a full lung capacity breath. Like yeah, try to fill your lungs you as well. Yeah. You feel like somebody has like their hands on the back and not letting you finish that breath. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. So now, now let's try it where you open your shoulder blades. So I'm not saying round your shoulders forward. Mm -hmm. You're not squeezing them on your back. You're just separating them. So if you imagine your shoulder blades as like sliding glass doors and they're just mm -hmm. opening. Mm -hmm. Now you'll do that. Okay. And then try to take a deep breath in. So... So fill your lungs to their max capacity. And, yeah. And so yeah. you just can notice how you can just, you can get in so much more air. Yeah. And so, I love the sliding door, the sliding glass doors opening. That's a great visual. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Um, so for surfers specifically, I find myself saying over and over and over again, separate your shoulder blades. Breathe into the back of your heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That really helps um, surfers with that straightened thoracic spine, straightened neck um, to really use their full lung capacity. Yeah, that 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 is so um, so common with with clients that I have too, because you're you're in this paddle mode, and you're literally having to activate these huge upper body muscles in this posture that is exactly putting you in that place if you don't recognize that you're locking in there you know lumbar spine totally contracted head out of alignment paddling hard because this set's about to land on your head and sometimes yeah. it's necessary just to do something that you have to do but then coming off of that sitting up on your board and resetting so that's exactly that kind of idea. Just what are you doing with your breath to recover? And then how are you sitting on your board to come back to a strong foundational place that you're not exaggerating those tendencies in a paddle or being out of posture? So little tools and tricks like that yes. are hugely valuable. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I, I couldn't say it better. Um, yeah, it's hard because you have to be in full spinal extension. <laughs> and it's hard to breathe like that, but you have to. And yeah. yeah, you're just like paddling. And so it's, you know, it's not ideal conditions. But then you're right when you're sitting on your board and you're waiting. Okay, now we can do our prep work again. We can realign the spine. We can get those muscles to come back into like their optimal tone. We can get that fullness in the back of the rib cage again, align ears over shoulders, shoulders over hips, lengthen your waist. Um, you know, another thing, a lot of my uh, surfer patients um, will do hypos on their board waiting, you know, for waves. It's like a great, really fun time to do it. Um, and so you're kind of like straddling the board and you can kind of put your hands, you know, on your legs and sort of press mm -hmm you know, press away from your legs to help lengthen your waist and breathe into your rib cage. Um, and that can be like a great reset. And it like decompresses your spine after having to be in such an extended closed position. Mm -hmm. um, for yeah, so you'll, you'll see like, I'll, I'll, sometimes I try to turn my coach trainer brain off when I'm surfing. So I can just be but you know, you, you, you can't yeah. help it. You're like, look, and you see, <laughs> and you will, you'll see, right. you'll see people sitting in almost the two extremes. They're either almost in a seated posture. That's that lumbar spine extension, like they're still paddling, 
really racked in there or they're completely opposite internally rotated through their shoulders passive in their lumbar spine and just kind of slump down and it does it takes the act of being present in what you're doing and really using some strength to put yourself in a place to where right at the moment feels like you just want to relax and recover but really what you want to do is be as judicious with what you have in your reserve to come back to that place. I do love that idea of kind of putting those hands on that upper thigh, almost at your hip and kind of giving you that ability to decompress and open yeah. through the rib cage. That's great. Right. Cause, Cause you yeah. do, you just lock into your hips, you know, like you're sitting in that place and you're still having to balance. So it's, it's not like a stable surface. You're really like, you can feel your hips just kind of locking in if you don't focus on them. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So we kind of, we might've just touched on this. This might be your answer right here, but I'm going to ask this question okay. anyway. Um, if to all the surfers listening right now, if you could have them complete five minutes of something every day to improve their surf performance, what would it be? And like I said, it might just be the hypopressive that we just talked about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Ah, it's great. We nailed it. <laughs> That's it. Absolutely. It's, it just covers so many things and it yeah. like all in one and it has like profound effects into you know, the rest of your day, how you carry yourself, how you um, breathe and, you know, even into like your sport and surfing, um, that it, it's, it's such a minor commitment and it has like such, you know, great profound results. Um, and so, yeah, with like the, the surfers I see and the, you know, the injuries and the postural dysfunctions, um, that is absolutely like the number one um, method, you know, of treatment that I give them. And yeah, it's something that you can, you know, you can do yourself anywhere. Um, and you can, it can be extremely simple, uh, just kind of like what we talked about there. Uh, we didn't even add breathing into that, but a little bit, just bringing your breath into the back of your heart. Um, it could be extremely simple like that with just one posture, or uh, we could turn it into like a series of, you know, 10, 15 postures and you flow through this, you know, kind of like a yoga flow where you flow through this series of postures uh, while you're doing this rhythmic uh, breathing um, technique. So, yeah. The hypopressive training um, can be found... Uh, sh uh Dr. Angie Millard is obviously the developer of this. Um, the core recovery method.com is where the hypopressive training is, as well as just much more extensive of the overall program that she's developed. You can go there, find out more about that. Um, she can also be found at uh, your Instagram. I just had it. Let's find it. Uh, core, at core recovery PT. And, um, and I just want to thank you so much for being on the Surf Strong Elite Show. Um, those little tidbits and those, those breathing techniques in there are just really helpful. And that's really what this is all about. Just giving our surfers and our community more tools to, just like we talked touched on earlier, more internal for themselves to be accountable to their own health and us then able to support them to further that throughout their whole life. So I just really want to thank you for taking the time today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Thank you for joining us on the Surf Strong Show, conversations for a healthy community. I'm your host, Greg Finch. I'd like to remind you to like, comment, subscribe to this and all of our episodes of the Surf Strong Show, wherever you get your podcasts. For all show notes and links that we talk about in the episodes, videos of the podcast you can go to surfstrongfit.com slash podcast for this and all the past episodes thanks for joining us it really means a lot